Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of Four Fusion Friday. It's Friday morning. Thanks for joining us, everyone. We've got another spectacular show of fusion music to talk about once again. And of course, as we do it each and every month, we pick a theme and we talk about four albums that are somewhat closely related, but not, right? And we also have a pick of another fusion album that has been assigned by George that we listen to, we discuss. And then George also has his kind of picks of the week. So with all that being said, uh, let me kick it over to George to introduce the rest of the team and uh, talk about our theme for today. All right, everybody knows uh, Eric and I from the Prague seat and we're regulars here. Uh, in the fourth chair this, this month we have Mike Jacobs, he's uh, a writer at All About Jazz and the admin of the Have You Heard group on Facebook, as well as the uh, Ahmad on the uh, Jazz Rock Fusion group on Facebook, which has like 80,000 members, Mike? Yeah, it's pretty big. <laughs> yeah, it's up there. That is really big. Yeah, wow. Congrats on that. That's great. We can it's only not mine. It's not much. mine. I just felt out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let me kick it off talking about the new releases uh, since last episode. I don't have a lot. Um, uh, there's a, a new single from Kaiosen, the Japanese duo. It's a two song single that they, there's actually 10 songs on the, on the disc because they're doing remixes and organless mix and drumless mix and all that stuff, but it's only two original songs. And we have the 11th studio album from Marvin, Dirty Horse, that uh, released just this week. Uh, for my money, it might be my new favorite. Uh, I know at least Eric has gotten some spins on this. What do you, what's your call? I'm really loving it. I actually got, uh, I think Pete put my review up over the weekend, um, but I've been listening to this nonstop since I got it. I really like this one. Did you hear the last one? The last one was, uh, it wasn't the gypsy jazz one, was it? That no, no, the, the one, it was kind of like, you used the Stevie Ray tone. It was very, it was a lot more bluesy. I can't remember the name of it offhand, but uh, I didn't know if it was similar in that band or not. Their stuff is generally can't miss for me. I mean, they're just a really, really talented bunch of dudes. And I'm looking forward to hearing that new one. It's got that cool zebra on the front, you know, got to love that. It's, I, I was drawn in by the... Uh, the cover of it immediately. So uh, yeah, I'm sure it's, Very cool. it's pretty damn good. Yeah. And uh, the last one, uh, definitely not least, the fourth album from the Bolivian guitarist Carlos Fisher. This one's called Busqueda in Infinita. Uh, th this is great. It's probably my new front runner for album of the year. It's uh, wow. I don't know. I don't have any information on it. So I, it sounds like pro probably a quartet. Um, Great players, as you would imagine. Fisher released one of my favorite albums of the 2010s, Auto Retrato. And this one's almost as good so far. I've been playing it every day, but uh, that will be uh, so far at least. No hard copy, no files even, I'll, only streaming. I, I looked, wow. the only thing I could find was a Spotify stream. <laughs> really? If, is, that, is that what it's come to now? I guess. But, yeah, that's uh, crazy. Ugh. It may be able to come along later. Uh, the whole thing's on YouTube for those that want to check it out. I did pick this up too, George. Oh, okay. Yeah, I forgot that was out too. Uh, new Aristocrats with uh, the orchestra, uh, Primus Chamber Orchestra. I've only gotten one listen in, but it was impressive. Well, yeah, I saw the uh, advanced track on YouTube for that. That was pretty, pretty cool looking. I haven't heard the rest yet. And how do you think they meld the orchestra with the band? So far, I mean, I didn't think the orchestra was obtrusive at all. I mean, I thought it blended really well. Like I said, it was only one listen. But, um, you know, a lot of times that doesn't always mix that well. I mean, and especially maybe in this format. Um, but on first listen, it, it was nothing where one was out doing the other. And, and, and the band seemed pretty upfront. So it's going to take, I'll, I'll get a few more in, I'll let you know, and maybe that's something we can throw around next month. But first listen, I was pretty impressed with it. Cool. Yeah, I was very skeptical when I first heard about that. I was like, Me too. 
Yeah. Doesn't seem like a marriage made in heaven to me, but uh, <laughs> I mean, the aristocrats are so talented. They, I'm sure they can pull anything off, but uh, I'm glad to hear that most people are digging it, That which means I'm sure I probably will as well. So I'm looking forward to hearing it. Yeah. Well, that's all I got. Okay, cool. That's some good stuff there. So you want to dive into the uh, the listening listening stuff, or you want to go into the four? Yeah, let's go to the four square. Uh, mm -hmm. This month, the four square. the The theme is self titled debut albums. So we have chronologically, we have eighty six is to Korea Electric Band, nineteen eighty sevens players. 99, the cat. 2000, cab. So, you want to kick us off, Mike? You're the guest. Okay. Um, are we going to work from four up to one, or what? Yeah. What's your number four? Okay, my number four. Actually, this changed a little bit in the last couple of days. Um, uh. It's going to be players. Um, <clears throat> I had I've had this album for a long time, and um, you know I got to say it's it's a very strange mix of guys. You know, like uh, T. Lavitz, and I mean they've all kind of appeared, except for maybe Henderson. They've all kind of appeared on each other's albums here and there, but um, at the time, yeah, it was it see it kind of felt like a throw together, which was uh, you know it's a thing for me anymore but um there's one i mean you know i was a mixtaper okay so when i would get a an album i i'd find the greatest track on it and like if if something blew the rest of the album away that took all my attention away so for this album it's freight train shuffle it's just like it's the best one of the best berlin tunes i know of and uh that's just that's all i really thought about for this album for like years. And I just, I listened to it a lot lately, obviously. And there were, there were more that I liked, but I, you know, I think because it, they're all good albums. Um, and I love Henderson in this period before he got, well, he kind of has like two guitar stages, you know, like there's this and the, the side man, early tribal tech where he's kind of like, Neo Holdsworth, you know, he's got that real Holdsworth tone. And then later he kind of got into the blues thing and a lot of the bar. I mean, it's all good, but I kind of like, I like, I dig this. So there's a lot of good spots from Henderson on there. The, the Creeping Terror is a, is a good track. Um, I think in, in terms of his writing, it's probably a little on the music schoolish side sounding, you know, like he really started his hit his writing stride later in tribal tech i think and then of course they stopped writing which <laughs> i could never figure that one out but um yeah so um the thing is uh like t lavitz love him in the dregs um he's always got a very idiosyncratic writing style and synth tone like he, he he's he's got those ppg wave tones that real you know they're they're very T, they sound like T and nobody else. I don't know anybody else that uses them. And um, it's a cool marriage in some spots more than others. I, I think it's more uneven than the rest of the records here. So that's why it's number four, but it's a good record. So. Cool. All right, Eric. My number four is the Chikoria. Um, I think for me, it's just, maybe it's the 80s sounds that Chick is using, the production. I'm not sure because I listen to the playing and I think the playing's fantastic. But it's that, I don't know if it's caught in that period for me. There's just some, uh, some drum stuff that's going on that the electronic drums or whatever they're doing with percussion. I mean, there's some great stuff on here, um, like Got a Match. I know they played that, I think, live for years, right? I mean, every time I look at something on YouTube, you can find that. Um, there's not as much guitar as I like. I think Henderson's on one tune, and is it Carlos Rios? Yep. 
is kind of scattered. And when he plays that stuff, I, I do enjoy. I think I'm trying to look at uh, Cool Groove, I think has a really nice guitar. The the closer, uh, Silver Temple is a good closer. But for me, it's it's dominated by those keyboard sounds. And I'm just not always thrilled with the sounds that Chick was using at that time. Um, so that's why I think it's my number four. I think the playing, and when you actually sit and listen to the playing, it, the songs are good, the playing is good, but it just has that sound to it that kind of takes something away from me. Mm -hmm. How about you, Pete? All right. Before I get started, I do want to thank our viewer, Brian, for sending me this cool Zappa shirt. Thank you very much. Um, this was kind of difficult for me because I think all four albums are impressive for a lot of different reasons. And three of the four I have a long history with, two of them even longer, and then one I've only been listening to for a short period of time, as impressive as it is. So as anybody, everybody knows who watches the channel, that history with music on a personal level means a lot to me. So my number four, it's great, and it's probably more cohesive than my number three, but it's at number four because, again, I don't have a lot of history with it, is Kick the Cat. Uh, really good stuff. I really like this band a lot. I, you know, George turned me on to these guys not that long ago, so I've been digesting their catalog in just a short amount of time. But, I mean, there's some great stuff on here. You know, Song for Ramsey is incredible. A uh, lot of great, like, unison playing going on it's kind of funky at the same time you got porno jazz sick grooves lots of great soloing i love the bass work on this album uh the guy is a really really good player chris um what else trouble in paradise nice and jazzy you got squirt which is super intense blow me also super intense it's a killer album uh i just i had a really hard time ranking it above the other three because i've only been listening to it for such a short period of time but uh Given a little bit more time, I think this might easily pass my number three. And we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. So, George, back to you. All right. My number four is uh, Chick Corea Electric Band, actually. Uh, kind of like the, the first two episodes, I'm kind of going with, uh, there's a couple of songs on here that I not that fond of uh, no zone and India town are kind of, you know, not a lot happening with those tunes. Uh, like Eric said about the tribal tech on the first episode, the good songs on this, I like better than, or as much at least as the, the rest of any of this stuff. Um, Got a match King cockroach silver temple. That stuff is like five star songs, but then, some of these other songs take it down just enough for, and like Eric said, the production also is a little bit annoying, although I'm kind of over that. But uh, the other three albums do sound more organic and they are a little more consistent. So I'll put this in the four slot. Mike. All right. Um, this is the one that changed places on me. Um, number three is Cap. Um, and I'll tell you why, because for the most part, I get tuned into composition. Like that's, yeah, the fusion has a lot of chops, guys. And, you know, that can really wear you down after a while. Um, and it's usually the composition that sets things apart for me um, and keeps me coming back. But, and, and you know, this was going to be number four for me until... I started listening to it again and man, they just play their asses off on this. I mean, you know, Dennis, obviously, but I have to say I had, you know, I, I didn't buy this when it came out because, it, you know, at Tone Center, I love what they do, but you know how it is. You know, uh, Barney does a lot of throw togethers, you know, like, guys and and it's admirable you know like just like moon june and uh and show we do to for abstract logics do now um you know they'll try and put guys together that never played together and sometimes it works and sometimes it's you know and um 
I saw this one come when it came out, and I had Edge of Insanity, which is a McAlpine album of Shrapnel. And uh, I guess that's that's like 86. That's like right around what the other albums we're talking about. Um, and it was a little shreddy for me. I mean, I, I, I respected the technique, but harmonically, he wasn't really doing, uh, you know, he wasn't really getting me. So when this came out, I said, oh, yeah, there's a lot of talent here, but I, I never got it. Well, so I, got, I just started listening to it lately. And my God, it, you know, I, I kind of didn't want to like it as much as I did, but I started listening to it over and over, and it's like, wow. Um, it, it raised up on the level for me because of the playing. Dennis just kills it. And McAlpine on guitar and keyboards. I mean, not many guys can kill it like that on two instruments. Uh, and Bunny Brunel, who I really don't have on anything else. Uh, but, you know, he's a great player too. Um, I can't say that the compositions are as mem memorable as I would like them to be, but it's solid. It's solid. And uh, yeah, I'm going to come back to this more than I thought I would. So that's my number three. All right, Eric. So my number three is players. And I'll take what Pete said, and I'm kind of the opposite. I'm, I'm kind of new to all of this, but this is one that I've had for years. And I used to go to a record store in Albany. Um, and when I was getting into Prague, this is the guy who got me some in a tribal tech and he got me. And for some reason I walked in one day and he's like, you got to pick this up. And I usually picked up what he suggested. And obviously the guys on this cover are fantastic players and everybody knows them. I think with this one, again, I'm going to get picky. And I feel like the sounds T lab it's use again, kind of give it a smoother feel than I would like. I mean, there's definitely piano in there and stuff, but I think like the opener crystal, it does kick into gear as it gets going. But when I heard that opener, I'm like, whoa, it's a little soft, you know, a little smoothie. But I think side two really kind of turns the tables on this one. I mean, I think all of those tracks on side two are fantastic. That really got me back into this. And I think when I walked away from it, the only thing I really didn't care for was 50-50, uh, which I think is Steve Smith. Um, and I'm not sure who the other guy is on here, but um, he's that a song, player from Vital Information. Okay, so that song really doesn't do much, if anything, for me at all. That's a skip for me, at least. And obviously, I was going back and listening to this full. But um, I love Scott's playing, and I think I agree with you, Mike. This is, you know, I like his playing here better than, you know, I've gotten a couple of his solo albums recently where it's more bluesy than I think you know, the jazz side, although obviously he's thrown his jazz licks in there. So this is definitely the era of Scott that I enjoy as well. Um, Jeff Berlin is fantastic. Steve Smith does a great job. Like I said, I think some of it, it's just the stuff that T. Lavitz puts on top. Some of it's just kind of, I guess I just don't like those synth sounds he's using. It's probably the, the best explanation I can have, but songs are great. That side too. The live stuff, um, the way the audience is brought in sometimes is a little odd. Like you don't hear anything. And then at the end of the song, it's just like somebody's pushing the, you know, pushing it up. So that kind of sounds a little bit odd to me, but I think there's a lot more energy on side two. Um, and it's a, it really, like I said, 50, 50 is probably the only one I really don't care for. So seven out of eight is not bad. So that's my number three. Yeah. As an aside on that record, um, you mentioned uh, the guitar player and kick the cat, Chris Siebold. Well, he played with Ernie, another Chicago guitarist named Ernie Denoff, who I think George knows. Uh, and Ernie is a friend of mine on Facebook. And he said he was actually at Hop Sings when they recorded some of that album. So that was cool. Pretty cool. All right, Pete. Yeah, I'm gonna go with players as well for number three. Uh, I bought this when it first came out and I remember being completely into this and just kind of like mind blown. Cause you know, I mean, all four players are, these are virtuosos, right? I, I loved Steve Smith in, you know, 
Journey and Jean Luc Ponty, and of course, uh, Vital Information. You know, he's got the jazz chops. I prefer him playing jazz, actually. I, I've always loved the drag, so I was well familiar with T. Berlin is one of the best bass players on the planet, and I always loved Scott Henderson. And I, I remember how like disappointed I was that he didn't do more on the electric band album and tour and, you know, kind of left after that. So for me, this was really cool. And I was very excited about this. And for years, I always talked about this great one-off fusion band and whatnot, but uh, and I had listened to this for many, many years. In fact, George and I joke behind the scenes many times about how I, I seemingly lost it in my collection for like the longest time. I could never find it. And I, then when I finally did found it, I've actually listened to it a bunch of times since then, even before we were talking about doing this. And I don't love it as much as I used to. I don't think it's held up as well for me based on what I thought about it, you know, 30 plus years ago. It's still really good in spots. I mean, I think, um, you know, Mike mentioned uh, Freight Train Shuffle. Incredible. Really, really good. Between Coming and Going is excellent. There's some fiery soloing on here. I'll agree with Eric. I don't like T. Lattice's keyboard sound on this album anymore. Just they don't do it for me. But there, there is this really high, high marks on this album. And then there's some low zones on this album. Uh, but I think the the really good stuff outweighs the, to me, a little lackluster now. I still think I give this pretty high marks, but this is the one that given some more time would kick the cat. I think this is going to be an easy number four for me. I'm just, I just wasn't ready to do that just quite yet, but I, I love Scott. He sounds amazing on here. This is one of my favorite guitar performances from him around this era, you know, the tribal tech stuff, notwithstanding, but uh, I think this is good. I think it, it sounds a little rushed. Like I know they kind of put this together pretty quickly. You got to wonder what these four guys given more time could have done together. Right. But we'll never know that. So number three, do you guys know if they toured? Did they actually tour for that record or do? I don't think they did, no. no. I think it was a strictly L.A. thing because if you look on the live credits, they say it's recorded between like a six-month period. And night. So they must have been doing gigs in L.A. Okay. But uh, the, the one story I did hear about this record was that, uh, that the, uh, I think T. Lavitz took it upon himself to record the live gigs and they they didn't even know he was recording it <laughs> i heard that too yeah they were surprised when it came out actually yeah and i will say also that uh the two there's two t lavitz songs on here that are also on story time and i think these are actually better than the, the versions on that record yeah. you know can't help but be better with berlin and henderson and steve Smith. <laughs> all right my number three kick the cat um this one for me I, this is the only one i didn't hear in its time I, I i got onto them a few years later a local bass player friend of mine turned me on to him he said i gotta go check him out and interestingly enough the band is not that fond of this record be it uh the production or just they they look back and they feel like they could have done this better they could have done that better i mean i i've heard siebel joke from the stage that you know we got our cds over here but don't buy the first one i mean <laughs> the other ones are much better i mean it's really good but the other ones are even way better i think yeah yeah to me uh like eric said about players it's like seven out of eight for me the one the one kind of softy here it's okay uh it's a little short it doesn't really they don't take the time to develop it Second half of the album is where it kicks in for me. Squirt, Squirt, I hear differently than everybody else because that uh, is their party piece closer now that they jack up the, the DBs and the metronome and they everybody goes crazy. So it doesn't sound right to me when I hear this album. But the three after that, Blow Me, Funky D Clown, and Era. Era is my favorite tune. To me, that's an unusual sounding tune for a fusion band. It's almost a little groggy, actually. Um, I hate to tell the guys, I think I like this a little better than Weirdo, the, the follow-up. But uh, I'll, I'll go number three, kick the cat. Back to you, Mike. Well, uh, my number two, uh, yeah, this is number two, right? Yeah. Uh, number two is kick the cat for me. Um, and, you know, even though it's a new album to me as well, um, 
what, what really looms large here for me in the, in the group that we're given is that, okay, Cab is a one-off. Well, two off, they did two albums. But it's kind of one of those, you know, hey, let's get these guys together and record now. Um, and so is players. What, you, what I hear on Kick the Cat is, and what's become very important to me in music in the last 10 years or so, is in this, this genre, what a band can do with stuff that a collection of all-stars can't. So I really hear and kick the cat. I hear that band dynamic at where they're, they're like, you know, it's, it's not like, oh, it's your turn. Let's take a hot solo and your turn. You know, it's, it's more developed. It's, it has more, they have more affinity for each other. I, I can hear it. Um, and I'm really impressed with Siebel. Uh, his guitar playing, his, his, his style, his ability, and his maturity is is really uh striking to me um this is I, I i've known about this band for you george but i i have to confess this is the first album i've really put my head down and listened to and i i think all these players on this record they can stand toe to toe with any of the guys we're listening to today i mean it's it's pretty amazing um so i uh, yeah I, these guys really you know, did it for me. I, I'm I'm very impressed, and uh, I think how many, how many more albums do they have out? They have four. Four. Well, I'm looking forward to getting the other three. That's for sure. And um, yeah, so kick the cat number two. All right, Eric. And I'm following up, Mike, with the same. And this is a band I got into through George. I picked up Gurgle. Um, loved that. And then obviously this was the homework assignment um, for this month. I still have to pick up the other two, but I'm the same. I love Siebold. I mean, that's usually what my thing is. I love listening to the guitar stuff. And I think he's fantastic. And I went through and listening to this also helped. There you go, Pete. Help me with my homework assignment for the guitarist corner, because I'm going to use porno jazz for a Wawa pick. Um, <laughs> And, but same thing. I think the second half of this album, I really enjoy, I think my favorite's that uh, Funky D Clown. Um, I like the little radio dial thing in the beginning and then kind of kicks in and just has a good groove. But I think what you said about Siebel too is, I mean, like you heard Porno Jazz has that kind of funky thing. The song for Ramsey, the opening is, it almost kind of loosens up and gets jammy. And then you get to, is it, Trouble in Paradise, I think that's almost more like that clean, jazzy, maybe more traditional jazz. I mean, it just sounds like he can do everything. And like you said, Mike, I don't, people may not know these guys, but you just listen to these albums and you're like, they're, they're top-notch players. They are. So I want to get a, a Marvin and Kick the Cat tour, little jazz from Chicago thing right. going. But um, yeah, that's, that's my number two. And like you said, I got to pick up the other two as well. So just so I can fill that collection because they're a great band. I love, love these guys. All right, Pete. All right. My number two, I think for me, is the most mind blowing of all of these four albums here. Uh, it could easily be my number one, but I've just got such an attachment to my number one. So I'm going to go with the Cab album for number two. Uh, this is just blistering from start to finish. Uh, you know, I've always been impressed with Tony McAlpine because he can do many different styles. Sure, he's a shredder, but he can do, you know, he can do the neoclassical thing. He can do jazz and fusion and prog and hard rock. He can do it all. Bunny's amazing. Dennis is all over the place on this album. Love it. Uh, Night Splash just absolutely kills. I love the melodies on the title track, Cab, uh, which has some just monster soloing from McAlpine. Chambers is just absolutely on fire during Just Perfect. I love One for Stern, which obviously we know who that is a little homage to, right? That's got great groove to it, like a lot of Mike's classic stuff, right? Uh, a lot of gutsy soloing. Boogie Me is fantastic. Elastic Man is just killer. If it wasn't for my number one, this is an absolute no-brainer for my number one. But today, like I said, I think it's the most, to me, it's the most impressive from a sheer musicality perspective out of all of them but it's got to be my number two because my number one 
sits right here. And we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Back to George. <laughs> Our number two is players. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm right on line with Eric. I like it all but 50-50, which is okay. Um, I don't think it really fits in with the rest of these tunes. I would say I, I differ on the what the standout tracks are on this, though. For me, it's Valentine and Vehicle. Valentine's a Henderson tune from the first side. Uh, wisely had Jeff Berlin solo on it because he's killing it on there. And Scott is, too. And uh, Vehicle is a T. Labitz tune. Uh, T and, and Steve Smith take extended solos on that one. Really good. I like the ones on the second side you guys mentioned. Freight Train Shuffle between coming and going great stuff um and i like what everybody said about scott's tone and playing from these days it's just i think it's so much more than where he's at now where he's at now is fine but man this when i heard him back then it was just like wow this guy's sound is so good and uh, they had all played together on a couple tracks on uh, jeff berlin's champion album so, but that didn't, I mean, honestly, those tunes do not match up to this. This, uh, I would have liked to seen where they went after this, but uh, as, as we know, it wasn't really a real band. So I have that at my number two, players. Back to Mike for his number one. Well, it's going to be, oops, come on. <laughs> Did you see that? Final cut. <laughs> nice. Uh, no. Don't start, Mike. Don't start. Okay. To Korea. Uh, I got, you know, like what Pete was saying, I have a long history with this one. And it's, I really tried hard to separate out, you know, nostalgia and memories and that kind of thing. But I got to say, man, I, you know, I, I got this on pre-recorded cassette. I only bought three pre-recorded cassettes in my whole life. And this was one of them because I wanted to hear it blasting in my 85 Monte Carlo SS. You know, my first nice sports car, you know, be so much cooler than all the other guys. I'm blasting Fusion, right? So, um, but anyway, it's okay. If you pull that out, all the memories aside and the Simmons drums, and the DX7s and the 80s production, I think this is still a monster record. It's monster, all right? Um, the first time you're hearing Weckle, come on, where'd this guy come from? You know, I mean, he just, it's like, bam. And then Patitucci. Um, oh, interesting aside, uh, Weckle, I've heard this story when, uh, John McLaughlin was putting together the 80s version of Mahavishnu. He was calling Weckle to be the drummer and he had already agreed to be in the electric band with Chick. So can you imagine that? But anyway, the, the tunes on this, you know, every one of them is, is like, I can, I can whistle. I can hum all of them. I know all of them by heart. Maybe all love is a little, you know, that's the only one, but that wasn't on my tape. So I, you know, <laughs> but I just think, you know, even all the down the downsides of this album, it's still it's still like a signpost for this type of music at the time, you know, using the technology. I mean, admittedly, I was not a Return to Forever guy. I backed into all that later on, so I've heard a lot of Return to Forever fans like poo poo this album. Not all of them, but some, you know, like that stuff better than this. And I can't, I can't speak to that because I went backwards. But this was just so monumental for me. This opened the door to a whole lot of stuff. So I can't, I can't not make it my, my number one. It's just, it's huge. It's huge. So check your career. All right. Eric? I'm going with Cab for my number one. And Mike, I hear you. But I think out of the gate and again most of these are new to me except for players and i hear tony mcalpine and i'm listening to this going this guy's playing guitar and keyboards yeah and the guy's frighteningly good and i think bunny burnell really stands out as well i mean okay we're talking trio but his bass playing is just 
I love his bass lines in this. Um, and I'm trying to go the opener night splash is just killer. Um, like Pete mentioned, one for Stern. I think my favorite is Boogie Me. Uh, just phenomenal. And I always don't laugh, but I hear that just perfect. And I hear the Chili Peppers for some reason with that, <laughs> the, the guitar thing for that. So, but I, I just, I can't get over the talent of McAlpine just playing keyboards and guitar. Um, I do like the compositions on that. I mean, there are things that, and I hear you, I think with a lot of this, one of the things that I'm struggling with a lot of times is we're trying to listen to these four albums each month that aren't familiar with me is, you know, with vocal songs, you have something to really connect with at times with that vocal. And I'm, I'm really trying to give these a lot of listens and get them in my head so I know the songs. And a lot of these really did stick with me um, after the repeated listens. Um, but like I said, I, I'm always listening for guitar and I just hear Tony and it was kind of, you know, protocol far with Greg Howe. That's just stuck with me since I heard that one. And this was another one. I just love Tony McAlpine. So I had to go with this for my number one. It is a great record. I mean, yeah, don't get me wrong. I got nothing against Tony. And it's just, it's just like a personal, personal taste thing. Like, you know, it's uh, the harmony. Uh, I, I don't know even how to explain it, but um, the, the harmony in the compositions doesn't connect to me as much, but the playing is just off the charts. I mean, that's, that's, I had to put it somewhere. <laughs> well, I get it. Yeah. These, that's the tough part. I'm texting George all the time saying, I can't figure out what's three and what's four. You know, you're always juggling these things, but. Hey, Pete, be number one. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I echo everything Mike was saying. I mean, I've been listening to this since it first came out. And for me, all these songs are so memorable. I know them like inside and out. So it's like, I think they have, to me, the songwriting on this album is the best of the four because yeah. they're just, they're so memorable and they don't even need vocals. And I just, they, they're, every song is distinguishable from the next. Uh, I mean, I agree. I wish there was more guitar on this for sure. And it does have some of the, this and I, the beholder, um, not I, the beholder, um, the one that George helped me out, the one that came right after this. Light years. The light years both have very similar production qualities which i the beholder went like in a different direction but uh i still love it a lot i mean rumble sidewalk cool weasel boogie amazing uh electric city got a match love those silver temple is amazing and i remember that was not on my original cassette of this album right and it wasn't until i got the cd years later i was like holy cow that's the best song on the album <laughs> that's on the album and that reminds me so much of the the electric band of just a couple hours later that did that sort of thing on every single album and did like whole albums like that. But I, I love, you know, Carlos Rios is great on this album. I wish there was more of him. I think Patatucci is tremendous. I mean, uh, I wish there was more of Carlos Rios everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. He's one of those guys. He's kind of like, he's kind of like Carlos Rios is like Ray Gomez, the guy who like showed up on albums here and there throughout the, the fusion, you know, boom of the seventies and the eighties, but you never heard enough of them. They were never stayed anywhere long enough. And it's like, ah, oh, I want more of that guy. But yeah, this is, uh, and you know, Eric Marienthal, I think would have been a nice addition to this album, but I think it's still great as it is. And uh, it's amazing how they made room in subsequent albums for all that sax and all that guitar. When you listen to this, it sa still sounds pretty full as is, but uh, that's what I love about this band. That's what I love about Chick's songwriting is he allows for all this space for all the musicians to do what they do best. And uh, I love him as a songwriter. As much as I love his his you know piano and keyboard and synth playing, I think he's a brilliant composer. And uh, yeah, I love that. And come on, that logo. That's t-shirt worthy, right? Right, George? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's my number one. This That was the easiest thing about this uh, this assignment. Is this, I knew this was going to be number one. It was the other three that were kind of difficult for me. But uh, all, all, all four really good albums, I think. If I could say one thing, one more thing about that. Um, one thing that came to mind, and, and I know George, actually, you didn't, was it India Town? Was that one of the tracks you didn't like? Yeah. Okay. When I was listening to that, it reminded me that back in that era, 
you still had, you know, fusion guys doing kind of things in the studio impressionistically. Like, you know, it, was not, it wasn't just a bunch of instruments playing a song like it pretty much is now. It, it was like, you know, they would produce it, they would make atmospheres, they would do, you know, and Chick really did well with that. Um, and I think even like Tribal Tech, you know, in the early 90s when they were doing the, the Pink album, like with Wasteland and stuff like that, you know, it just reminded me that it was more than just the song and the instruments. It was like the whole feel and the whole, you know, I miss that. I really miss that. Um, also, if, have you ever heard uh, GRP live in concert? You ever heard that disc? Yeah. But the versions of, you know, the songs on this album that are on that album are just, I love it. I mean, yeah. they're, they're better. That's, you throw Gambali and Marianthal into the mix and boom, it just goes up to 11. I totally agree with that. That's a great live album, by the way. Really good. Yeah. Actually, uh, also, um, Silver Temple is appeared a couple of years earlier on an Eddie Gomez solo album and Chick and Kazumi are on it. I'll have to, I'll have to get you that. Wow. I know you'd like to hear that beat. Wow. That does sound pretty amazing. All right. Well, my number one is Cab. Uh, when I heard this was coming out, I mean, it was almost designed for me. It was, I was eating up all the Tone Center stuff at the time. And then Bunny Brunel has two of my favorite albums of the 80s, fusion albums with Ivanhoe, and Momentum. Dennis Chambers, my favorite drummer at the time. And then they pick a shrapnel guitar player, a rock guy to be their guitar player. I was a little hesitant, not knowing if he could fit in with the, the fusion thing. But as soon as I got it, I mean, just totally blown away. First by the playing, of course. But then the way I connected with all the songs, I like every song on this a lot. Um, I scarcely could even pick out favorites. I mean, to me, it's all great. And they curried more favor with me by doing two songs from Kazumi's Kilowatt album on here. Those sound great. I mean, the playing is nuclear, especially Chambers, but everybody. Um, I mean, it's just incredible all the way through for me. To me, the songs are very memorable. Uh, maybe it's just a matter of time with you, Mike, as far as that. And could be, could be. they do have, they did have four albums, not just one or two. They ended really? up doing four, yeah, four, not in four studio and then two live albums. But uh, yeah, they're to me, that like, like Pete said, the one I knew was I knew this would be my number one. And these three I struggled with big time. <laughs> but yeah, that's my number one. Ooh. All right, George, do we want to move on to Lost Tribe? Yes. Yeah, so last month I assigned the boys Lost Tribe. This is a New York band, uh, quintet, a double guitar band, pretty unusual in fusion. Um, this is the first of th three albums that they did. And uh, I'm curious to know what you guys thought. Eric? Well, first question, I assume Walter Becker is Steely Dan Walker, Walter Becker that produced it. Yes. Okay. Yep. It was hard to find a lot on these guys. Um, but I did go, I spent a lot of time with it. Um, I really, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoy, again, this is another one where I think the second half kind of kicked in. Oh, and I went, I was surprised with the Wyndham Hill when you sent it to me and I'm like, Wyndham Hill, really? Um, I didn't, I guess, you know, I'm thinking George Winston and Michael Hedges. I didn't know they had kind of expanded their roster, um, you know, as time went on. I, you know, you always think of them as a new age label. Um, but I really liked, I think, once you get to track five, um, it seemed like guitar started picking up. There's a lot of the horns, I think, in the uh, early part of the album. So, again, that's kind of the stuff that I really liked. Once the guitars got going, I think that eargasm or not eargasm is it rhinoceros that was track five was really the one i was like okay here we go um and then pretty much right through that as it started going i think the only thing this is so minor so you know there was some like talking and rapping in a couple songs i'm like eh, letter to the editor yeah, letter to the editor yeah, yeah. um so that I didn't care for. It was kind of distracting almost in a couple of them, I think. Um, 
But other than that, it just it took a, a couple songs to get going. But I think once I hit like track four or five, I really enjoyed this. I don't know that it would have been something I would have sought out. Um, cause it really was, it was kind of hard to find information on these guys. I mean, do you, did they go anywhere else after this band, George? Did any of these guys go on to do other stuff? Yeah. All these guys are still all over They're out there. Okay. Yeah. Ben Porowski, the drummer, I've heard quite a bit. I mean, he's played on a lot of things and, uh, David Gilmore, not to be confused with Dave Gilmore from Pink Floyd also is a name I've seen on a lot of records and over okay. the last like 20 some odd years, you yeah. know. So what do you think, Pete? I dug it. Uh, I, I agree. I think it, it kind of picked up a lot of steam in the second half of the album. Uh, the first four, you know, the first three songs are good. Uh, I'd like Letter to the Editor, I didn't like it all. That was really the one kind of outlier on this whole album. But Mafongo, I thought was really cool. It's my favorite Puerto Rican dish, too. So, you know, you can't go wrong with that. But uh, I, I thought Four Directions was really cool. Um, Fool for Thought, also really nice. Really nice guitar playing on here. I love the fact they got two players. I like the, yeah. uh, the sax thrown in as well. Uh, and I think the compositions are pretty strong. And it's well produced. I mean, it sounds like like a major label release when it, it kind of is, right? And that's the thing that surprised me because I'm like looking at, you know, everything, the way they're dressed. I mean, the whole nine yards, it's like these guys look like the real deal. It doesn't look like just some obscure fusion band. So I like this. This was a pleasant surprise. And, you know, the fact that it came out in, what, 93 kind of tells you all you really need to know, right? Because in 93, we know what most people were listening to. So that's probably why this kind of like fell under the radar for most people. But uh, where did you first hear about these guys, George? Well, uh, Tower Records used to have an in-store magazine called Pulse. And the, remember that. Yep. the well-known uh, jazz writer, Bill Mokowski, he wrote a review for it. And he, he said, imagine a band that would be comfortable opening for either Living Color or the Brecker Brothers. Yeah. Yes. So put the magazine down and walked over and got to see me, yeah. <laughs> put it on the counter. I'm like, that's my band, you know? And uh, yeah, sure enough, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, George, can I ask you, because this was a debut. So I'm assuming, is that why you picked this one? Because when I, now that you've got me on uh, Rate Your Music, I think the other two are rated higher on there. Than this one is if i'm not mistaken are they that's surprising i picked it because i've been tying in the uh george's pick album with the four squared right. making it the same thing okay so yeah it's a it's a self-titled mm -hmm. debut yeah take a look because when i look that's what intrigued me i'm like george picked this one i'm liking it i might have to find the other two because they're actually rated i think the other two are rated higher than the debut but i think michael agree with me this one and the second one are of a thematic pair the third one's more acoustic, a little more mellow. The third one's like a different band. Yeah, it really oh, is different. Okay. But if you like this one, you'll like the second one. Dirt. And I think Mike slightly prefers it. I slightly prefer this one, but not much to pick from. They're both really good. Cool. What would you say, Mike? Well, I, you know, first of all, what, what Eric was saying about Wyndham Hill, that's like they actually, I think after this one came out on Wyndham Hill Jazz, they started a new division called High Street. That had, um, I think they they released the other. Um, they released Soulfish from this band. They released Steve Moore's band. They released, uh, and I think Steve Moore's band and these guys toured a bit together, which is wow. pretty wild. I wish I would have seen that. Mm. Was it Stress Fest? What was on Wyndham Hill for Steve Moore's band? Do you remember which one? I think it was Stress Fest, or maybe the one after that. Okay, I can't remember Stress, the name of it. Yeah, Stress Fest. Um, the other purplish looking one um got the old <clears throat> but um, yeah i picked this up in 93 uh, this is pretty weird but i looked at it and i'm like i knew Porowski from like a stern record i think and it looked really cool and i don't know if there's something that made me put it down and say i'm gonna like this more in a few years <laughs> and I bought it a few years later and I really dug I was right. I was right because my ear, like there's something about this record. It's not like normal fusion, if, if there is a normal fusion, but the fusion that was around at the time, they were really pushing like the jazz harmonic part and the rock harmonic part to really far ends of the spectrum. Like their rock was almost heavy metal in places and their 
their jazz was very bop in places. And, and then it has the rap thing, of course, which, you know, it, it didn't really bother me. I've sat with this record for a long time, so it, it, it definitely helps. I, and I think it's going to grow on, on you guys once you sit with it, too. Um, originally, if you would have asked me, Soulfish was my favorite. And I think it might have an edge on production values. But in going back, back to this record and listening to it a bunch of times, it's, it's a dead heat. I mean, with material wise, I think this is just as good. And, um, you know, there was nobody like these guys. And, the, you know, the fact that you had two guitars like of the caliber of Adam Rogers and David Gilmore, I mean, just right there, it's a mind blower. But then what Vinny, if like you can hear on this, and if you follow Vinny like I did later, his, his writing started to take a tack that really became, like if you listen to Fool for Thought, uh, it was very experimental in the way the songs were constructed and really cool. And it really influenced later bands like like Kneebody later on, like where they did like whole deconstructionism and stuff like that, which I see kind of a direct line. I don't think anybody else does, but uh, but yeah, it's really cool. And I'm actually, you know, if I would have bought it in 93, it would have sat on my shelf. I would have liked it later, but I had limited funds at the time. So I bought it later anyway. So um, about their other album, um, their other, their last album, Many Lifetimes, is very traditional jazz instrumentation sounding. It's, it's pretty, I mean, it's got some adventurous parts in it, but I actually ordered all three of those albums at one time, and that's the one that came first. And I was bumming. I was like, I thought these guys were a fusion band. <laughs> and then I started really listening to it and I credit that album I may not like it on the same terms as Soulfish and this one but I credit that album for opening my ears up to more traditional jazz instrumentation and being able to take songs on those terms without thinking in terms of electric guitars and stuff that I really like to hear you know so anyway but this album it's a great album I, I recommend it to anybody now, you know, as long as they have patience. And by the way, Structural Damage was that first High Street album for us. Yeah, yeah. Structural Damage. And they did Michael Manring's Thunk as well. That's, Love that album. That's a killer. All right. Well, one for next month is going to be Cornette Fritfall. Now that, now that you know I'm linking them, you can start thinking, how, what will the theme be? But uh, for those that actually know this album, which is probably not many, I do believe it was vinyl only when it came out. That would give you a clue. But uh, it's on the mail to Pete, and uh, I'll, I'll end up getting it to you at some point, Eric. Sounds good. Okay. Fritfall. Looking forward to it. Cool. Looking forward to it. So uh, next month, we'll have a new topic for you new four somewhat linked albums to be uh determined fairly soon i guess so uh, i want to thank uh everybody here for uh listening to all this great music and kind of somehow putting a ranking to them i know this was uh, kind of difficult it seems like everybody had the challenge which is the way it should be right none of these should be slam dunk i don't think and so far they have not been so they are i'm, I'm picking them wrong <laughs> i'm just glad he didn't put lost tribe in the rankings that would have been made things really hard <laughs> could have right i mean that it would have fit it would have fit yeah it would have fit. so for uh those of you watching we'll put the uh the album titles of everything in the comments below because i'm sure we're going to get a lot of people who are going to want to go investigate some of these that they haven't heard before and if you know these albums rank them as you like them down below if you've never heard them, your assignment is, because everybody gets an assignment on the show, go out and listen to them somewhere and then report back and let us know what you think. So, uh, George, anything to say wrap up today? This was fun. No, I don't think so. Just no. having fun talking fusion. Yeah, absolutely. So cool. So uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Visit us. Oh, Mike, why don't you, you want to plug uh, anything on your end? Um, yeah, just look for my articles on all of that jazz. Uh, and um, 
if you're into Facebook music groups, you can look for Jazz Rock Fusion and also my personal group, Have You Heard? Uh, just send a request and I'll, I'll let you in. <laughs> did we, did we want to uh, mention what we got cooking other than the next show? What Eric did? Oh, yeah, we probably should. Yeah. Eric, I'll let you do the honors. We are lining up an interview with uh, Danny Rabin from Marvin, the guitar player. And uh, hopefully we'll get that out probably between the airing of this show and then the July show. So it should be out sometime in June. Yeah, mid-June, I think. So that should be fun. We'll get to chat with him about the new album and about the band. So that should be loads of fun. So uh, stay tuned for that and a lot more here on the channel, guys. Uh, with today is Friday. So we got coming up uh, Martin Popoff and myself in the fun house because I'm actually going to pop out of this house and go into the fun house right after we're done here. You know how that works. Yeah, if you believe that, I'll, I got a bridge to sell you. But uh, otherwise, we've got coming up uh, this weekend, we've got uh, the UK Connection on Saturday and album homework assignment on Sunday. And then we start off the new week with the Hudson Valley Square. So thanks for watching, everybody. Visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on YouTube all together all the damn all time. The damn time. For Mike, Eric, and George, I am Pete. Have a good weekend, everybody. We'll see you next month here on 4Fusion Friday. Take care. Bye-bye.